Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. God, your word is force. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have well, hi, I want to welcome you to our Bible study here at Bible Talk here in Orlando, Florida, once again. After uh, about seven months of traveling, we're, we're back in Orlando. It's good to be back. We're continuing on. We're here. Yay. Ta-da. We're here. So welcome back to, our, to here in our home in Orlando, Florida. Well, it's not our home. No, it's our no, tent. Not yet. Our it's our homes. temporary place. Yeah. yeah. We have a home in glory land. This but I don't want to go there. This is where we're yeah. dwelling at the moment. But it's good to be back. It's good to have you with us this evening. Yes, We're glad you can join us. We're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter to the church of Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. This is our fourth chapter, our fourth part of this study. If you've missed any of the other ones, uh, they're available here online, so you can look at them. You can invite others to come. It's BibleTalk.com. Well, like I said, we're, we're glad because, you know, it says in the Psalms, Behold, how pleasant and becoming it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And while this is not as together as I would like it to be, we're, we're blessed to know that there are people around the world who can join us through modern technology. And so we're glad to do that. Which is something we did when we were in New York. We yeah. Skyped. And we, we did the Bible study with Skype over in Leeds, England, yeah. to continue on with our fellowship over in England, which is, uh, has been a real blessing. But let's get into our Bible study. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Mark, Brother Mark, to, to lead us in the prayer to open the night. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for being in our midst and for giving us peace and, so, and that we can rest in your word, Lord. Just take this word and put it in our minds and our hearts so we can live it out in our lives and show and put our candle on top of the basket so others can see. Amen. 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 Well, as I said, we're continuing on in our study of First Thessalonians. This is the fourth part, and we're starting this evening in First Thessalonians chapter 2 at verse 3. And I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. Uh, Paul says, For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Uh, the first thing I want to say is, you know, he talks about his exhortation. I'll talk about that in a second. But why do you think he has to kind of defend and say, you know, what we're doing, our exhortation doesn't come from error, doesn't come from impurity, doesn't come by way of deceit? Because that's the kind of messages they were receiving? That's because that was had, out there. E even here in the early church, mm -hmm. it had become all too common that there were people, quote-unquote, exhorting the brethren, mm -hmm. and it was from error. There was error involved, there was impurity involved, and there was deceit involved, mm -hmm. okay? Now, let me just start by saying what exhortation is. To exhort somebody actually comes from the Latin, which means to, to urge somebody to do something. Mm -hmm. And Paul's life was about urging people to do something. Mm -hmm. right? You said one time... Uh, your goal whenever you do a sermon in, in anymore is to get a person to make a decision. Absolutely. I, I say that every sermon should should demand a decision. Is, is exhortation part of that? Well, it is because you're urging somebody to do something. You know, what you want them to do is decide to do that or at least understand that inaction is a decision. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think most people think that there is such a thing as sitting on the fence, when in fact there's not. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. There is no such thing as not making a decision. So in, in our teaching, in our preaching, in our exhortation, we want to urge people to be doing what they should be doing. We want to we want to trust them to do that. That's obeying God's commandments. Obeying God's commandments. And, you know, that, that doesn't sound like, I mean, it's not legalism. No. Because his commandment is love. So, uh, you know, let me just try and put this in perspective. First of all, Paul said, 
and this is from First Corinthians. He said, "But one who prophesies now to prophesy that pro prophecy literally comes from the Greek prophetes, which means to speak for somebody. So prophecy is speaking for God, and you know, um, I, I I think uh, Bible Bite that'll be going out tomorrow and talks about this about how." we are supposed to be speaking not only for God, but we're supposed to be speaking what we have heard from God, not making new stuff up, okay? But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. So these are the things that Paul was doing. He's exhorting. You know, he says to, writes to Timothy, his son in the faith, in 2 Timothy, he says all scripture is literally, what he says is God breathed and profitable. It's profitable for teaching, for correction, for training in righteousness, for reproof. That's exhortation. You know, you're calling people to, to that higher place in the Lord. Because the fact of the matter is, and I've been, this is one of the things that I've been preaching all over, basically all over the world for the last seven months, mm -hmm. because it's what God put on my heart, is that God's great desire is that you change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, He doesn't change, because He doesn't have to. He's the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. Hallelujah. But if God's purpose in our life, and Paul says this clearly in his letter to the Romans, is that we, who are the elect, the saved, the, the children of God, God's purposes and his promises, that we are predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. So God is changing us. He's transforming us and bringing us from glory to glory. Does he love you just the way you are? He loves you where you are and the way you are, but he loves you enough the desire to change you into what you can be. Because remember, God's initial plan, Genesis chapter 1, let, let us make man in our image. We are supposed to have within us this image of God. And I don't know when the last time we looked in a mirror was, but we don't look as much like Jesus as we should. I'll, I'll say that. And I, I think you need to see that and be willing to agree with that. So what God wants to do is to change us. So day by day, we become more and more like His Son, Christ Jesus. That's the purpose of God's, God the Father in our lives. So that's what Paul is calling us to. That's what he's exhorting us to, is this higher life. It, Paul is one who wrote in Philippians and said that the calling of God is an upward calling. Could you say that the, the potter is molding and shaping us to be more into the image of God? He is. I, I would say that because I wouldn't be the first to say that. I think mm -hmm. Jeremiah said that very, very well. And, and the neat thing is, is that this process is a joyful process. Mm -hmm. It's not like he's putting more and more burden on us because the more Christ-like you become, the less burden there is in your that's life. So and that's a fact. Absolutely. Right? So this is the purpose of Paul's life, is this exhortation, this urging people. First of all, if you're not saved, the first thing he does is he says that we beg you to be reconciled to God. And you can only be reconciled to God, the Father, through the shed blood, the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And once you have been saved, and brother, if you don't understand this, you know, go look at some of the, the Bible studies or, or write to me, and I'll send you a link to a sermon that I preached in Manchester, England at a pastor's conference mm -hmm. about how we come into this new life. And it is new life. The old things have passed away, but we come in carrying all of the old things on us. That's why, that's that's a whole other story. I'm not going to that tonight. But that's what the Lord is trying to do, is to bring us to that high place, that high calling of His. So, yeah. Well, I'm, are you getting back? You know, yes, that's right. I had a question between yeah. error in purity and, and way of deceit. What are the differences between those three words. Well, I'm glad you asked that question, okay. Lord. Let's talk about, okay, from error, first of all, all right? Because there's three distinct things here. And he's saying, okay, his teaching, his exhortation is neither from error, all right? It's not about impurity, and it doesn't come by way of deceit. From error. Paul wrote to Timothy and said this. He said, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. That's in First Timothy. So Paul is saying, 
at this time, in the early church, in the New Testament church, there are people out there who are teaching who absolutely shouldn't be teaching. Well, one of the things Paul, no, Paul talked to Peter in Galatians because they were going back under the law. That was one of the errors. Well, not to Peter. Well, he, he's talking to the Galatians, yes. Right. Oh, not not who, here, right. but elsewhere. Oh, who has bewitched you, foolish Galatians? I, I, I think, you know, I hear a lot of people as we travel, you know, a lot of people say to me, oh, yeah, I go to a New Testament church. Okay. I don't want to say to them, okay, well, which one? The well, Galatians, yeah. the Corinthians? I mean, listen, a lot, of, a lot of the problems that we experience today, you know, it says in Proverbs, there's nothing new under the sun. That we're back in the early church, and as a matter of fact, they may be worse today. But those problems existed. So there was bad teaching. There were bad teachers. There were false prophets. All of these things. That's why Paul is, is saying this to the Thessalonians. He's saying that's not what he is. All right? Mm -hmm. So there were people out there teaching things in error. That that implies as an accident. Or, or, or out of ignorance. Well, remember now. They've turned aside wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertion. So there are some people who want to be teachers, and I don't know, you know, I mean, that's between What's them and the, the Lord, yeah. what, what the motivation for that is. Oftentimes it's pride. It's Sometimes people are called something. into it by, you know, by their appointed. organization yeah. and appointed to it when they shouldn't have been. Right. You know, James wrote and said, let not many of you become teachers, for by this you incur a stricter judgment. So you need to be real prayerful about... It's, it's a great um, responsibility. And we're going to talk about responsibility here because Paul talks about responsibility. Yeah. But so, you know, he, again, remember I'm, I'm quoting from Timothy. I'm going to quote from his second letter to Timothy. Mm -hmm. Because that's the greatest example we have in scriptures in the New Testament of discipleship. Right. Paul teaching Timothy and instructing Timothy to pass on what he's been taught to others. All right, That's discipleship. It's not Bible college, it's not seminary, it's discipleship, which is what the command of Jesus was at the end of Matthew. Disciples. But he said, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. So there's a lot of error out there. There's a, oh my goodness, there's a lot of error in the teaching going on in the church today. How do you know? How do you test it? Well, you test it against the word. You know, I'll say this, Jesus gave us a plan, a formula, we'll call it what you'd like, to make sure that we're not deceived by these errors. And he said, if you abide in my word, if you dwell in my word, if you live in my word, that means not just reading it a lot, when you need to be reading it a lot. You know, be, be diligent, to study to show yourself approved unto God. But you need to be meditating on it through the day. You need to be have that word just richly dwelling in you, is what Paul says. So, um, but he, Jesus said, if you abide my word, then you're truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Right. So, how do you protect yourself from error? Staying in the word of God. That's it. That's what Jesus said. And there's so many places that we've been to that they're still in the milk. Well, there's a lot, a lot of people, you know, again, that's what Paul said to the Corinthians. He said, by this time, many of you should have become teachers, and you're still in the milk of the word. Right. Um, but... We wonder why I can't get through a verse. Okay. Sorry. No, that, that, don't be sorry. That's, mm -hmm. that's good. I, just to go a little further down that rabbit hole, one of the things I want to say to you, maybe you're new to this Bible study, our purpose is not to, to become Bible scholars. Mm -hmm. Our purpose is not to really be able to understand better just what Paul is saying to the church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica. Our purpose is, first of all, to see Jesus Christ more clearly, because He is the Word. And if we have to imitate Him, we have to know what He's Well, doing. and not only that, it's the more clearly we see Him, the more the more we will be like Him. Right. All right? Which which ends in seeing Him face to face, and we will be that's as He is. All right? Um, but uh, that's why we'll let the Holy Spirit take us wherever He wants to go on this. Because we're studying the Word, mm -hmm. not just a piece of the Word. That's right. And we're using Paul's letter here as kind of a jumping point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't get frustrated if uh, we don't go fast enough for you. I, my only concern is we go fast enough and be where the Holy Spirit wants mm -hmm. us to be. Okay. So that's, that's from error. And just by the way, and I, I was sharing this with a pastor just recently. 
you know, there is a lot of error out there, and there are a lot of people doing bad, there's a lot of bad teaching out there. That's a fact that, yeah, you know, you need to be aware of it. But you need to make a distinction, and this is what I said to this pastor, between brothers who are in error and wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, a brother who is in error needs to be gently corrected with the Word of God. A wolf in sheep's clothing needs to be bonked on the head and dealt with. So, you know, how do you discern that? Well, there's a good word, discern. It's called about the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But a pastor, you better be able to tell the difference between brothers in error and wolves in sheep's clothing. All right, so that, that's error. And I'm just going to kind of, I mean, I'm kind of scamming these, scanning them. Impurity. Paul said, oh no, you know, let me, let me start with what Jesus said uh, in the book of Revelation to one of the churches when he said, but I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. A lot of the pagan religions, most of the pagan religions, not all, but most of the pagan religions in the time of the New Testament, in the Roman world, they were very much into licentiousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, you hear about the temple prostitutes and everything, but how do you, how do you gain support? Well, you, you give people what they want and tell them what they want to hear. Tickle their ears. And this impurity, I mean, if you don't understand that there are some things, you know, it says there's a song or a, a saying, love makes the world go round. I don't, that, that's not, well, maybe it's true if you have a heavenly and spiritual perspective, because the only thing that keeps this whole planet spinning at the moment is God's love. But the fact of the matter is, in, in the natural, the only thing that keeps this planet going and things going is greed and lust mm. and, and bad things. Now, that sounds judgmental. Let me remind you that in the New Testament, I'm talking about after the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle John says that we know that this present world is in the power of the evil one. You shouldn't have to look far to see that. I, we, we, as I said, we've not been back long, and I came back and I, I turned on the television, the telly. And I'm astounded at the filth on television. Astounded. I mean, just on regular broadcast television, it's in the commercials, but in the sitcoms, they are so impure. And one of the things that we don't see much anymore is people being ashamed. And you know, I'm afraid that's because their consciences are being seared. And they're no longer feeling a sense of shame. that They can, you know, sit and, and be bathed in this, in this film. Well, because that's what people want. That's what people want. Um, this is from Second Peter. Peter said, For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they, and these are the false prophets, the false teachers that he was talking about, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. So Peter, talking about false prophets, it's in Second Peter chapter 2, says that they entice people by, by fleshly desires, by sensuality. So this is what was going on in the time of Paul, and this is why Paul says, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not using, I'm not speaking to you in error, and I'm not using impurity as in, to entice you, right? And, and by the way, you know, he, we talked about uh, in the earlier studies about the fact that Paul evidenced that he was not doing those things. You know, his life was a living testimony. He, in other words, let me put this more briefly. He practiced what he preached, unlike the Pharisees. And then he said, by way of deceit, because there were people out there teaching, using deceit for their own purposes. What kind of deceit? Well, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he said this, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit in which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. This is right into a church. And he goes on to say, For such men, talking about these, these teachers that they're listening to, 
For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So there was, there was a lot of deceit. There was not, it's not just bad teaching. It is evil teaching. And there were people out there telling lies. Now, he says that this has got to be, they're workers of Satan. How do you know this? Because Satan is a liar by nature and the father of lies. And it says somewhere the deceiving will be that will be deceived. will be deceived absolutely deceived. yeah and that there's like a pyramid scheme or you know your boss is telling you lies and his boss is telling him lies and the top dog is satan and well, he's is. deceived and he's telling lies i just recently um there's someone that we know who was involved in a i'll have to say it's a cult okay that's, that's basically what it is but it's, it has the guise of um, very sweet and nice, and it's healing. Well, that's what, that, that's what he says. Such men, right, disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder. Right. I mean, they mention right. God in this, and that the healing is coming from God. But reading the info, where this guy started from, the one that's going out and writing books and, and teaching other people, he got his information and was getting his information from psychics and telling him what books to read, what to go after. I mean, this is, how can you not see that? Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, now, where did you get your doctorate in theology? I don't have a doctorate in theology. Oh, you don't have a doctorate in theology? No, I don't. So how do you know this thing? Because I have the Word of God. Because you have the Word of God. Yes. You know, what, what happens is when you spend time in the Word and this deceit comes up, I'm telling you, you will have that ability for the Holy Spirit within you to bring those things to mind that are going to show you these errors and protect you from those errors. Mm -hmm. It's when you're not in the Word that you're not going to have that. Right, right, because you know He'll call these things to mind, but they got to be in there in the first place. And yet these people believe that God is speaking to them, and I mean they're so deceived. Deceived them being they're, they are. They are deceiving, and they have been deceived. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well. They do what they know. They do what they've been taught. And that's, that, but that's why Paul is exhorting these people here mm -hmm. to beware of these things, all right? And why were they doing this? Well, let me give you one reason. And, brother, you don't have to, you don't have to go far. Uh, I don't want to sound judgmental, but, but turn on your television and turn on to one of the Christian television stations and watch a few shows and see if this is not the case today. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Now remember, that's, that's the people of God, right? Who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Mm -hmm. Titus 1, verse 10 and 11. I gotta tell you something. Mighty dollar. I, there, are, I I have a real difficult time watching any Christian television yes, yes. because I, you know, it's like a, you say, well, there's some good stuff on here. Yeah, there's some good stuff. I mean, give me a glass of nice cold water on a hot day, and that's good stuff. And then put you know, put a little junk in and a little junk in and a little junk in. It. At what point am I going to say, hey, I don't want to drink this glass from that glass at all? And that's that's where I am. And mo one of the things that I see in common to most of these things is boy they're out for your money yes, they're they out for your money they are out for your money why is it that when somebody tells you that you should give and brother i believe in giving i believe you know that we should but why does it always have to be to them mm -hmm. why can't the spirit of god put that spirit of giving that liberality of giving that paul talks about in his letter to the romans in your heart and then show you where the need is and you just give it. Why does it have to go to this guy who needs to put it stay into his television air. to stay on the air so he can ask you for more money, to stay on the air so he can ask you for more, more money, so he can stay on the air to ask you for more money, so he can stay on the air to ask you for more money? You know, one, one of the things it says here, and, and people say to me, people have been saying to me for 35 years, oh, you're judgmental, oh, you have no love. Well, I know something? I do have love. I have a love for the Lord our God. I have a love for his work. And I refuse to back down from this. But why did Paul say, 
there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those who must be silenced. Where is the people? Where are the Silence. people of God who are going to stand up? Where are the where are those shepherds who are going to go out and bunk the, the wolves in sheep's clothing on the head? Where's that one verse where it says it must they must be silenced? Titus one, verse ten and eleven. Right. But you know, I, I just see all these people out there uh, who see the church as a great job. I mean, ministry is a great job, makes great money. It's like being the CEO of a company. Uh, well, let's let's read on and see that's the truth. So he, he said, let me just read this verse again, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, he said, our acceptation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Right? So Let's just skip that. Not, not as pleasing men. Because here's what Paul said too in Galatians chapter 1. Think about this. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. That's Paul's letter to the Galatians. Now, Paul over and over talks about, you know, it's not about pleasing men, right? The gospel, by inference, I say that the gospel will be more often than not, displeasing to men. The gospel is always confrontational. You know, if there's this concern about, okay, you're going to please men or please God, that means if you're pleasing God, you're going to displease men. You can, you can take the, well, and I'll put quotes around this, you can, you can take the most holy Christians that you know, and oftentimes a good sermon, you want to rile them up. You want to rile them up. Why? Because it's what I talked about earlier. It is Jesus Christ, it is God the Father, it is the Holy Spirit at work in your life. Changing you. <laughs> purifying you. Making you more like Jesus Christ. What has he got to do to make you more like Jesus Christ? He's Get saying, rid of the things in your life that are not Jesus Christ. How does he do that? By Kill bringing the them to the surface. By bringing, because that's what Job said. Job said, I know that when I have been tried, I shall come forth as fine gold. How do they remove impurities from gold? They eat that gold up. And what happens is those impurities float to the surface where they can be scraped off. So oftentimes God's work in our life, you know what it's going to do? It, the, his word in our life is going to, it's going to put that heat in our flesh. It's going to cause those impurities to rise up and go away so he can scrape them off. It's more right? molding and shaping. Paul says that the flesh and the spirit are constantly in conflict. And the Word of God is always... Con Listen to what I'm saying now. The Word of God is always confrontational. Yes. Because it is confronting you with that call, with that exhortation. It's also conf conforming you and confronting you to what? push you into shape. That's right. And yeah. the flesh is pushing back. Well, that's so. There's you know, a right. And Alice talked about you know earlier on the, the potter. Well, if you watch a potter make something with clay, it doesn't look like a very pleasant process for the clay. Yeah, so, push on. Well, you got to push on it. You got to smash it. He's got to slap, slap it around to get the bubbles out, and uh, you know it's 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 a process. And then when he finally gets it shaped the way he wants it to be, then he takes it and puts it in a fire. I mean, you know, it's not a, this is not a pleasant process to the, the flesh. flesh. Right, right, right. That's why the Spirit has to come above right. and override the flesh. Jesus Christ was always, now, I, I want you to think about this, always confrontational. Yes. He is confronting us with the truth of the Word, calling us to that high place that is the Word of God. Why is it confrontational? Because our flesh doesn't want to hear it. Our flesh doesn't like it. Our flesh wants to rise up 
This is why Paul says there's this constant conflict. It's either you're going to be, it's like a seesaw. You know, your, your flesh and your spirit. One's going to go up, one's going to go down. And your flesh doesn't, by of its own volition, want to go down. It's that pride. It's that pride. It's, it, it is that pride. It is that damnable pride. Yes. It's, okay. As Arthur Burt would say. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 when you are, assess this, when you appraise it spiritually, you will see that what he is doing is bringing comfort. Because the word of God will comfort you. But to the flesh, it's going to appear confrontational. And when you're not walking in the spirit, it's going to be very, very confrontational. You know, there's one instance that's uh, recorded in Luke. And Jesus is blasting the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Right? Blasting the Pharisees. Why? Because of their hypocrisy. And as he's telling them this, there's a bunch, there's a bunch of lawyers. Now, the lawyers, are, these are the, the theologians, basically. These are the teachers. Okay? It's not lawyers like the guy that's on your television set saying, sue somebody today. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's a different thing. These were people who were expert in the law, the Mosaic, the Levitical law, right? That's what they were. They were the theologians of the day. They were the teachers of the day. Mm -hmm. So the, these guys, they're sitting around listening to the Pharisees getting blasted, and they're, oh, give it to them, give it to them. <laughs> Suck it to them. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says something, and, and one of the law lawyers says, Teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. Well, I'll remind you of what Psalm 119, verse 165 says. Those who love thy law shall have great peace and nothing shall offend them. So if you love God's word, and if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind, you know what? You're not going to take offense. You're going to recognize that loving touch of the potter in your life to bring you to that place where you are more and more like Jesus Christ. And if offense does rile up, that's your flesh. Exactly. Substitute, of, exactly. substitute offense for right. flesh. Right. But the problem is, you know, since we have gotten into this McDonald's theology, where, where the goal in, of, of a church, quote-unquote church, and the success of a church is measured by how many hamburgers you sold, how many people you can get through the door, how big the, how big this, what's the size of your building, what's the size of your congregation, what's the size of your budget, then what you're, the last thing in the world you want to do is offend anybody, the last thing you want to do is insult anybody, the last thing you want to do is confront anybody, because they'll walk out on you. What was the description that one guy had of the church in Africa? It's uh, miles oh, in Nigeria. long and wide, but an eighth inch deep. Yeah, right. Yeah. That was a, a bishop. You don't want those kind of Christians. No, no but... Well, I don't, and it doesn't matter what I want, but I don't think Jesus does. What he wants is mature. That's not what Paul wanted. He wanted people to grow up and be mature in the Spirit of God. Humble. Hum well, humble. Um, so, you know, it, it's got to be where you're in that place where you're willing to do exactly what Jesus Christ said, which is to deny yourself, pick up your own cross daily and follow him. You know, it's a, it's a matter of dying to yourself. So uh, we need to get to that place where our, our flesh is in subjection to our spirit, and our spirit rules. But the upshot of all of this it can be summed up in one verse, because we're living in the last days. I, I say that without apology. We're living in the last days. And Paul, again, writing to Timothy. You know, these things to, to Timothy are important, because again, it's not just Paul teaching Timothy. But it is Paul teaching Timothy what he knows and instructs Timothy will be passed on. Right? right. So this is the ongoing teaching to the body. So Paul says in the last days men will not endure sound doctrine, mm -hmm. but wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3. No, it's not. It's Second cha Timothy four. chapter four, verse three and four. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I I don't know why it seems like you know we we give this reverence to anybody that has a business card that says pastor or apostle or evangelist on it. You know, it's John wrote and says test the spirits for many false prophets have gone abroad. Uh, I, I'm not. Listen, we're supposed, supposed to give to honor. We've got to give honor to whom honor is due and double honor to those who are preaching the word. All right? But the fact of the matter is you've got to test and examine all things and hold fast that which is good. You've got to understand 
that there are a lot there were in the time of Jesus Christ there were a lot of bad religious people out there in the time of Paul later on and in the time of you right now right here right now there are a lot of people out there who are teaching and you know what they're teaching according to people's own desires the desires of the flesh that's that impurity that's that licentiousness so uh, test what you hear you know I go out I preach I preach a lot of different places and typically one Always of the things that I will do take uh, care of business is what you're saying before I start preaching, I'll take care of business. And one of the things I do, particularly when I go into a congregation someplace where I've never been before, I say, you know, you don't know me. Uh, don't take my word for anything. Test what I say. Test what I say against the Word of God. Not, not by your traditions, your, your, you know, tested what I say against the Word of God. If what I say is not the Word of God, don't be polite, don't be nice, kick me out of here. But if it is the Word of God, then you're responsible for it. Test what you're hearing against the Word of God. Okay. So now Paul says that he was entrusted with the gospel. That's that's a great trust. Yes. You know, it's like, listen, if you go to take your paycheck down to the bank this Friday and you deposit it, you are entrusting that bank with your cash. How about you go back on Monday and say, you know, I want to write a check, I need some of that money. And say, oh, no, we spent it on something. Mm -hmm. How, I got like, Mark. I mean, how would you feel about that? You wouldn't feel very nice about that. How do you think that the Lord feels when He has entrusted somebody with the gospel? It's precious. And they do something other than what He is calling them to do with it. They twist it. Maybe. Because you want to know something? I promise you, the, the gospel is far more valuable than your paycheck. Amen. That's close to identity theft. Well, it's worse. I mean, it really is. Okay. Listen to this. This is from Acts chapter 9, verses 13 to 16. This is when Paul had encountered the Lord, the risen Lord, on the road to Damascus. And God gave instruction to a man named Ananias to take Paul. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, Jesus said, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. Paul was entrusted with that thing, which is probably the most precious thing on this earth, the good news of Jesus Christ. And he was responsible for it. So he understood, he understood the responsibility he had because God had entrusted him and called him. And he said, I pre if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. If I do it under compulsion, God called him. God, you, know, you hear the word anointed a lot. And the word anointed to the saints doesn't appear actually very much in the, in the Bible. It really doesn't. I mean, you know. It's just that one. Well, I mean, we hear everybody running around talking about you got to get the anointing, you got to get the anointing. You know what you got to get? You got to get the, find out what your appointing is, yes. what God has appointed you to do. So that's what God appointed Paul to do, right? Mm -hmm. He entrusted him with the gospel. And then he goes on in that verse and says, uh, God who searches our hearts, examines our hearts, right? Mm -hmm. Let me just read. So we speak not as pleasing men, but, but God, pleasing God, who examines our hearts. We did, before Alice and I left, I guess starting in the end of last year, oh gosh, for, for quite some time, almost half a year, we did a study looking at the things that are pleasing and the things that are displeasing to the Lord in the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And one of the things you see there over and over and over to those churches, a guy says, I know your deeds. He knows what's going on. Well, listen to me. He knows your deeds, but he searches your heart. That's right. That's right. But he searches your heart. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance. Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I rejected him. Right? For God sees not as man sees. Not, this is not David. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord searches the heart. 
corpses as they were going along to get David, right? Mm -hmm. It's not only possible, but it's all too common to have good deeds and yet have a bad heart. Mm, that's true. Yeah. There's a lot of people out there doing good deeds. With a bad heart. Yeah. Right? Now, this, this takes a little maturity. This is meat here. This is, you know, we're not giving you the milk here tonight. One of the things is, you got to understand, it says in Isaiah, that our good deeds, our, our works, are as filthy rags before the Lord. Our works don't impress Him. God searches our heart. He knows our deeds, but He searches our heart. Want to know the best example of that? Listen to this now. Mm -hmm. And I've said this many, many times here. I find this one of the scariest verses, if there's such a thing as a scary verse in the Bible. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says this, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Look at their deeds. These are the things that so many... Pentecostal and charismatic churches are talking about all the time. We prophesied, we cast out demons, we performed miracles. Look at that's their deeds. And yet Jesus says to them, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, he searched their hearts. Their deeds were okay, but their hearts were bad. Now, how do you deal with that? They're deceived. No, I, they are deceived, but I'm going to tell you how you deal with that, because I think this is important. I think this is important enough for a Zoom. Mm. Because the Word of God says that the heart is deceitful above all else. How can you protect yourself from that deceitful heart? You can't. What you can do is trust in a loving God who began a work in you and is able to complete that work in you. And you can do what David did. You can call out, you can cry out. You can call out, you can cry out, create me a clean heart. You need to humble yourself and recognize that there are things you can't do, but that God can, will, and desires to do in your life. So you need to, to have that same attitude that was in Paul, it was in David rather, a man at the God's own heart who said, cleanse my heart. And he also asked forgiveness of things that he wasn't even aware of. That he wasn't even aware of. Yes. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of your faith. And humble yourself. And trust that God will keep you from this error. Because it's an error of pride. What this shows, and how I can see where an evil heart these people have, is because they come into, on that day, on that day, when you finally come into the presence of the living, risen Savior, standing there with nail-scarred hands, and walk up to Jesus and say, look what I did. Did you see what I did? Brother, you better fix your eyes on Jesus. This is why Paul said, I have determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. The only thing that matters is what Christ did. You have nothing that you have done it has gained you that favor with God. This is amazing grace. And that amazing grace, by the work of Jesus Christ, is what makes you right, reconciles you to the Father, nothing else. So, okay? I was trying to remember where the, the verse was that God goes about to and fro searching um, the hearts that, are, that belong to him you know, I have to check that. I this day you're close. Um, I can't remember what it was, but there's some that he's going, he's going out. Yeah. And, and searching hearts that belong to him. Or yeah. Like uh, but that's that's what he does. He, yeah. he searches the heart. Um, so, he, what you know? I I did a sermon. Gosh, I don't know how long ago now. It must be over a year ago, over in Winter Park Church uh, with Pastor Robert Dunlap about, it's called, uh, it's only high school science. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was pretty cool, actually. I talked about how God has chosen to put the moon in place to reflect the light of the sun 
And that's kind of an analogy. That's a revelation of his plan that he can use, you know, a dead old rock, beat up rock, to shine so brightly to cast shadows and, and that because it's reflecting the light of the sun. And that's our purpose is to reflect the light of the sun. And one of the things about that is that, you know, we only ever see one side of the moon because of the way it rotates and the earth spins and rotates. You only ever see one side of the moon. God sees the backside. There's a part of you that nobody will ever see. And you hide. I mean, it's just hidden from everybody else in the world, but God sees it. God knows what's in the depths of your heart. Now, that shouldn't be a cause for fear. Not if you understand that he is the potter and his desire is to remove the impurities and, and perfect you, to bring you from glory to glory. That should be that should be a wonderful thing, is that we know that he is molding and shaping us into what he desires us to be. It shouldn't be a cause for fear, right? Mm -hmm. uh, fear is the work of religion. That's the opposite of faith, right? Faith is the operation of the spirit. So, you know, Paul said, I have to make sure that I make this clear. Because when I talk about God knows exactly what's in your heart, maybe maybe that causes some fear in some of you out there. <laughs> maybe it should. Maybe you need to examine yourself. Paul says, let a man examine himself. Maybe you need to think about what's in your heart and, and do some repenting. Repenting is a great thing, brother. But by the same token, you know, Paul in, in Romans chapter 7 talks about being the chiefest of sinners. And he talks about, even in his life, after he's saved, he says, the very thing I hate, I continue to do. And yet, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8.1. So that gift of God has removed that condemnation. God is not looking for opportunity to punish you. That's, that's an old theology I had growing up as a kid in the religion I was in then. You know, I had this picture of God as just waiting in, in the sky to, for the least opportunity, least excuse to bonk me on the head. No, that's not God's purpose. He doesn't, he's not a God of harm. And this is why it says, God who is, by the way, love, it says that perfect love casts out fear. There shouldn't be any cause for fear in your life if you're right with God. And even when you're right with God, you've got to understand something. You're not, you haven't achieved perfection yet. I mean, if Paul, in look at, examine the life of Paul, if Paul could say that he hadn't achieved it yet, trust me, you haven't achieved it yet, I certainly haven't achieved it yet. But, and God is the one who's perfecting us. And again, how does he perfect us? By getting rid of the stuff in our lives that's not Jesus Christ. Can that be a painful process? Of course it can. But he's not doing it to punish us. He's doing it you know, perfect to perfect us. And we need to be giving him thanks and praise in and for all, all things. Uh, Absolutely. That's okay. So in, in verse uh, 5, Paul says, For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Let me just read you, you know, this, this whole thing, and I go back. There's a reason that Paul is saying these things to the Thessalonians. And they should know it. Because remember, Paul came to Thessalonica from Philippi, where he had been unjustly beaten, illegally beaten and imprisoned, right? And took a miracle of God to set him free from that. Paul's not out doing these things, you know, for, for Corinth, sordid Corinth, gain. Corinth, when he's writing these. Right? Writing what? These, these letters to the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians, the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians. Okay. yeah. Okay, so then... It, while he, he's writing to the Corinthians, he says, talking about, again, to so many of the people that are out there, quote-unquote, ministry to them, he says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as, as if insane. I'm more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked a night and a day, I have spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food 
in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. 2 Corinthians 11. Let me tell you something. This is not, he didn't come with a pretext for greed. He didn't come to exalt himself. He goes on to say in 2 Corinthians, he said, we're afflicted. This is talking about himself and the people that are traveling with him. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despaired. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body, of, in the, body the dying of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. And then again, in 1 Corinthians, he says, For I think God has exhibited apostles last of all, as men condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We're weak, but you're strong. You're distinguished, but we're without honor. To this present hour, we are both... This is Paul. You don't get more faithful than Paul, as far as I can see. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated, and are homeless. And we toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as a scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. That's hardly a CEO. Mm. I mean, I, I, I see and hear in all these large churches, you know, pastors who are making billions of dollars and uh, saying, oh, well, this is like being a CEO of a corporation. I, I don't know. I just, listen, I'm not, I, again, I'm not saying this to try and condemn anybody, but I, I'll say it to sound a warning. It just doesn't line up. Because when you find people that are preaching, there are people, I, I write to this, you know, there are people out there, there were people out there 2,000 years ago, there are people out there today who are tickling ears for sordid gain because it can be a great job. Oh, yeah, it can be a great job. Jesus said, don't be surprised that the world, you know, or outside of Jesus, don't be surprised that the world hates you. It hated me first, it's going to hate you. We are trying, we want to encourage and work with people as we travel around the world to help, and this is our program of discipleship, to train them to help equip them so they can go out and fulfill the ministry that God has called them to. But if you feel, and by the way, every Christian has a ministry. Some Christians have different ministries. That, that A ministry, a call to what we call the five-fold ministry, where they go out and, and do these things. And I say to people, the first thing, are you sure? God is are you sure? And I'm not saying, are you sure? I'm saying, are you sure that you're prepared for this? Count the cost. Mm -hmm. You know, a man came to Jesus and said, Lord, I'll follow you. And Jesus turned to him and said, The foxes have dens, the birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now I paraphrase. Are you sure you want to follow me? You better count the cost. What's that uh, saying that, I don't know where it came from, uh, in Jerusalem? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, yeah, what uh, Mark is talking about is uh, uh, something that we've quoted here. I'm not quite sure of the origin of it. It says, in Christianity, or what we understand as Christianity, started as a fellowship in Jerusalem. It became a philosophy in Greece. It became a culture in Rome. And it became an enterprise in the West, here in the U.S. It's become a business. There are people out there doing it as a business. Uh, if you're following Jesus Christ, you better be prepared to pay the cost. That's a fact. One of the problems is, you know, Paul talks about a lot of activities within the quote-unquote body of Christ give opportunity for the outsiders to blaspheme God. They give opportunity. And, uh, you know, we see all of these scandals that have taken place in the church. Now, how can you eliminate the scandals? I, I, I don't know. You can't eliminate them. But the fact of the matter is, so often it's like, you know, something shows up and somebody is, a uh, scandal is exposed. And I, the biggest question I have is, how did so many people sit there for so long under the teaching of a person who is involved in this ungodly activity discern. and not discern, not get any clue that there was something wrong? Why wasn't the Holy Spirit operating? Yeah, so I mean, these are really legitimate, as far as I'm concerned, they're 
these are legitimate questions. You know, Paul ends this verse by saying, and God is witness. God is witness. God knows. No, you know, like I said, there are many people who will come to me on that last day saying, hey, look what we did. Look what we did. We, you know, and they'll, they'll rattle off all the things they come. He said, depart from you, even once I never knew you. What is God looking for? He's looking for him to be exalted and glorified through our lives. It's about him. It's not about us. And the fact of the matter is, I don't know how Christianity ever got to be good business. Well, I, I do. I mean, actually being a, somewhat of a student of, of history, I see the evolution of what Christ started into something that is not Christ-like. Well, that's what you just said. Yes. Starting Jerusalem, very small, and right here. But I like what I just said it too. I see an evolution uh, of taking what Christ started and making it something that is virtually absent of Christ. And that's where it winds up. You know, in the Church of Laodicea, in the last book, uh, uh, last picture of a church in the Bible is in Revelation chapter three, where it talks about this church that is absolutely devoid of Jesus Christ, and obviously it's not truly a church. The it's only thing I take exception with is the word evolution. It's almost like well, de-evolution. It's it, it's not going up, which is no, what you no. think from evolution. It's devolving. But it's, it's going it's, down. Right. But it's it's changing. It's it, it's a it's a process, right. and it's not a good process. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's all of this is process. Mm -hmm. if, if we're being transformed and brought from glory to glory, that's a process. process. Right. And if your flesh is overtaking your spirit, you know, as a process. You're headed for the wrong place. I'm right. just saying, you know, we're, yeah. Yeah. you know, everything in this world is going downhill. Mm -hmm. Yes. This this process is an unnatural process. Mm -hmm. It's calling us from glory to glory. That's uphill. Well, you know, I, I don't want to get into, it, especially with you here. I don't want to get into a discussion on evolution. Uh, my my whole thing on evolution is this: in the beginning, God created. Bing, 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 bing. That's what's written. That's the abbreviated version, huh? Okay, that's, that's, that's God's version. In the beginning, God created. So that tells the whole story for me. But this, the simple fact of the matter is, in spite of what science or so many scientists or so many schools and so many people, you know, it, let every man be found a liar, but God be found true. Evolution is a theory. It's still a theory. That's right. But there is a law. It is the third law of thermodynamics. Everything has a shelf life. Mm -hmm. Everything is decreasing. I mean, you can go out and stare at a rock, and if you stare at that rock long enough, you're going to see it disintegrate into nothing. Yeah. Or at least sand. Well, I mean, well, I mean because everything has, it's, it is a devolutionary process. That's what we know. That's what is, that is the evidence that is out there. When it began right. in the garden. Listen. Okay, and what Mark says is true. What, what is truly phenomenal is that following, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, puts you on an upward path. The calling of God is an upward call. He is transforming you, bringing you from glory to glory. And I pray, I truly pray, that our time in the Word together would help all of us be more attentive to His Word, and that He would use that Word to mold us, to shape us, to change us and to make us more and more what we should be, which is like Jesus Christ. Therefore, beloved brethren, be imitators of God. That's what we're supposed to be, is imitators of God. And the only way you see God is in Jesus Christ, His mm -hmm. Son. Well, until same time, same station next week, We'll see you then, and may the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of his name. Wayfaring stranger, while traveling through this world below. There is no sickness 